I think we have gone through a lot of content around using kind of like a base models, you know, using just the tool, using Invoke. There's a lot to consider when you start thinking about training your own model and how you compose the data set, how you teach the machine effectively what the different concepts are and how you tease out and structure what it what it exactly is that it's going to learn. When we're working with customers, I think one of the first things that we do is we, we talk about model strategy and thinking about what are you using the model for. I think that's the number one thing you have to start with when you're creating a model is you need to ask like, what, what is this going to do for me? What am, what am I looking for this model to do? What tools do I need in my pipeline? If you think about um, what you're really trying to do is your trying to teach the machine your language. You're trying to teach it to understand what you mean when you say a certain thing. So you can train, you know, better understanding of your prompt terminology for general purposes, but you can also teach new things to the model. Uh, a analogy that I used um, to, to an artist that I was talking with the other day was, if you think about the kind of the landscape uh, and, and prompting, uh, as, as kind of like the prompt is coordinates and the model is kind of like the map or the landscape. The prompt is kind of telling you where on the map to go, but if there's nowhere there to go, the prompt's not going to work. So if I'm prompting for something that doesn't exist inside of the model, it, it has no, those coordinates don't lead you anywhere interesting. Um, and so part, part of this whole question is, do I, do I just need better coordinates? Do I need a better prompt uh, to get to where I, I'm looking to generate? Or do I actually need to train new content inside of the system? And these, these can be done at the same time. If you watch the previous training video that we did, we, we had another analogy, another explanation for it. And I think a lot of this is really just starting to understand what you can do with this when you do have that capability to train the model. So I'm gonna start talking today about one specific use case of model training. Now, if you have a ton of artwork, or if you've got a ton of intellectual property, you've, you've made a, a game before and you have all the character artwork and you have a ton of stuff and you're just trying to train on top of that, that is not what we're gonna talk about today. Cause that's, that's relatively well-trod territory. We know we can train good models when we have a lot of data, when we have a robust set of data to, to generate that from. Well, what happens when we're just starting out and we're trying to think about how do we build a model for our use case? How do we build something from scratch if we're just coming up with a new idea or we're just trying to figure out how to get started with creating a, a custom tool that, that helps us in the generation process, um, but isn't ultimately like a, um, t taking a lot of IP and just consolidating it into a prompt term. That's what we're gonna focus on today. We're gonna focus on this idea of crafting a tool, crafting a Laura that, that is usable in the context of a character for this use case, but you can apply a lot of the same principles to, to the process. So uh, feel free to ask questions along the way. Um, I'm gonna jump into training first and show you a model that I already created. Uh, this is something that I that to kind of talk through the process here. Um, I'll share my screen so you can see this. The process that I took was I found a way to generate a roughly consistent character in Invoke. So I created this data set, it's entirely synthetic. The filtering is I picked the things that matched what I was going for. I, I left that in the data set and anything that didn't really fit the data set, I removed out. And that's kind of what you can do with synthetic data sets is you're serving as a discriminator in some sense. You know, if I'm prompting for a very particular style and I generate 10 images and only five of them match the style, those five go in the data set. And if I train something on that and I can generate more than my data set grows, I can build a better model. But I'll show you this character that I created. This is probably, this first example is probably the worst 
one as far as consistency goes. Uh, we could probably debate whether I should take this one out, but I like this style, so I left it in. And I'll go through the captioning here, but I want you to get a, a feel for the character that I'm like, what are the features of this character that I'm like trying to capture? Um, see this guy's, you know, you got more of like the mustache, uh, rough, rough beard there. This guy's got kind of like a comic book style. You, you can see a little bit of the same characteristics, you know, beard, uh, kind of pretty sharp nose. He's got like longer, not long, but medium length kind of wavy hair. Right. And I'm, I'm capturing this type of concept in different contexts. Someone, someone said, uh, they can't see the screen. I'm just just con confirming. Can people see the screen? The screen is fine. Okay, cool. Um, so there are there are features here that I'm trying to capture. Now you'll notice that I've got a bunch of different styles, right? Like there's this comic booky style. There's this more like painterly style. Um, I even have one here that's like much much kind of like more Ill illustrative. And detailed this one's kind of more of like a rendering and a 3d rendering style and basically what i'm trying to do this is another example of one that i probably could take out but i'll tell you why i left it in um what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to show it this character in different contexts and this is part of the strategy for when you're teaching a model something you are trying to create enough diversity so that it sees what is the same in the data set. Now, the way that I've captioned this is I've captioned it all a picture of Z43 care, or short for character, uh, dressed in a green coat, brown shirt, yada, yada, yada. Uh, this one should probably have like a style associated with it. So this is kind of like, a, I'm, I'm looking at the data set and seeing ways that I can improve it. Um, but this is the consistent piece, is a picture of Z43 care. And if I go over here, I see this one. I see a picture of Z43 care there. Um, that's the consistent piece. Every single piece of data in this data set has that trigger phrase, right? It's a picture of this character. And what we're trying to do is include enough detail of all the other stuff that should not be associated with our trigger prompt. We're trying to train it to understand what this character is. We are not trying to train it to understand a specific style. We're not trying to associate our character with a specific style. We want our character to be able to be generated in any style. And so the, the thing that I'll call out is if I had created all of the data for this character in this style. This was the only thing that was in my data set. It is, it is creating a relationship. It's understanding the character in the context of this kind of painterly domain. And it assumes whenever I ask for this character, it needs to be a painting, right? So what I wanna do is I wanna create a diverse and kind of like uh, context independent understanding of what exactly is this character so that it's more useful as a tool so that I can do more things with it. Because if I only am ever, ever able to prompt for this with a specific set of clothing and a specific style, it's going to be a lot more limited than if it really understands this character deeply and I can do whatever I want with it. So you're trying to find a diverse data set that can show the same concept you're trying to train in different contexts. If it's a character, you probably want different attire, different clothes. If you can get even different genres, I mean, you're like, you're in a really good spot. Uh, different styles, those, those things help it really understand that character. Now, it's, it's not to say that if you don't do that, it'll be terrible. Uh, it's a spectrum. And we're just talking about what are ways that you can structure your data set in order to improve that quality. Um, so I'll take kind of a couple more peeks at some of the rest of the data. Uh, and the reason I include that left this one in, even though this guy on the left really doesn't look as much like our character is that I was trying as hard as I could to get something that looked like our character with a different expression. Cause this guy's got this like, you know, st stoic looking expression throughout all of these. And I was trying to get some variation there. 
probably probably could take it out, but uh, I left it in. There's also one in here where he's like screaming, and it's like a I think it's a pretty bad one as well. Uh, maybe I'll find it here momentarily. Yeah, this guy, this one's he's kind of angry, but it's bad because he's got like three rows of teeth. So uh, that one's a little bit janky. But you can even see I tried to create like a photorealistic version of it. And so if we if we're playing the game as humans, um, of what are the features that we see that are common between all of these like different characters, it is likely that we're finding like, you know, some kind of mid mid length hair. It's not, you know, a uh, buzz cut. There's like a beard component. Uh, he's, he's kind of got this like stronger, broader look frame and face. Those are the characteristics that I see common to all of these things that I've generated. And that is effectively what this Laura now generates. And I mean, I think I, I'll, I'll admit that this was not like the, um, I didn't spend the most time perfecting this Laura, um, because I just wanted to create something really quickly for us to kind of talk about, but we'll, we'll, we'll show kind of what happens from this. I don't think this data set is particularly great. I think it's okay. Um, I think the Laura that came out of this is useful to an extent. It is more useful at guiding it towards this type of character. I don't think it's perfect by any means and I'll show you where it fails. And I think it's kind of predictable where, where it fails. Um, but we'll jump into the tool and kind of start looking at that. Um, I am going to read a couple questions before I do that, just to make sure that we are really uh, answering everyone's questions. Um, someone wanted to drop in some questions. Uh, wants to get really good at detailed captioning, creating consistent data structuring for captioning, understanding variables and structuring data training details, style and subject training, things to do and not to do, understanding the training user interface. We're not gonna spend as much time in the training user interface today. Uh, I, there is a video that we recorded recently that goes through that. We've done a little bit of like data captioning and stuff like that. Um, if people have questions around stuff that I just showed, this is probably gonna be like the last time that we spend a whole lot of time in the training UI or the captioning piece. So if you've got questions on that, let's go ahead and get those in and we can answer that. Um, and then we'll, we'll talk about kind of other, other downstream, uh, questions around like, how do we use these things that we've generated and what are, what are the use cases or what are like the ways we should think about how we create these and how we improve them over time. Um, someone called out having a diversity of style, background, time of day, lighting, clothing, accessories, composition, all leads to more flexible Laura. Yes. Uh, I think this person's uh, one of the more like ma machine learning uh, minded people in the, the audience. Um, so I think they're they're relatively well versed in all this stuff. Um, someone asked, wouldn't image to image with control net be good for creating pose and expression variations? Maybe, maybe um, you, you could do that. Uh, you can get like, if, if you had a control net and uh, image to image process, you pro probably could strategically create a pretty decent set of like expressions and character poses and things like that so that you've got a diverse data set. I didn't do that. I just kind of like, you know, quickly created a synthetic data set, but we can, we can talk about how that might work as well. Um, it's definitely, definitely a, a tool in your uh, toolkit if you want to do that. Um, um... Yes, and somebody called out, um, the interesting part is when you use this initial LoRa that you train to improve the synthetic data to train the next LoRa. And we'll talk about that as well and kind of the, the strategy of using this stuff. So let's let's jump into Invoke. Um, I've got my character LoRa uh, data set here and you can kind of see um, it a lot kind of clearer here because we can see all of it at once in the gallery. Um, and I'll just kind of show you what it does now. So this is the um, the Laura. I think I actually misnamed the Laura name, but it is uh, Z43 uh, care, as we can see in the training data set. That's our trigger. And we want a picture of this character. Uh, and we'll take out some of this other stuff and see what we can do to get some prompts in. So if we take a look at our data set here, um, I'll show you how I created it 
after this. Um, but we'll do like wearing a jacket and maybe we'll do like a, I'll just use my synth art style, uh, wearing a jacket standing in front of a wooden wall. Uh, and I've got this set at about 0.56. I played around with it, felt like that was the right spot. When you train a Laura, you're not always going to get a Laura that just like is perfect at one. A lot of times the reason why when you're downloading custom models, you've got very specific instructions is because that person has taken the model, run it through its paces and figured out like what they were going for is best realized at about uh, this piece. Uh, somebody said they want uh, me to move the camera. I don't know what that means. Um, in any case, um, we, uh, somebody asked about this, uh, trailing negative. I'm actually, this is a down weight, so this is not an accidental negative here. Um, this is me down weighting the TI, the, the synth art style. And it's mostly just to make sure that it's not over, over indexing on, on anything there. Um, we'll, we'll generate this and just see what we get. How about that? Uh, and maybe I'll generate three. Uh, I think it's just loading up the model now. So, uh, it'll take a second. We'll generate three and we'll see what we get. How about that? And I'm expecting that there will be some inconsistencies. I'm expecting that there will be, you know, see, like we've got, uh, got this person here. That's not all right. I think it might be. The style. Let's try um, full concept art, uh, watercolor, and we really want to get this character. Let's up this weight so that it's making sure that this is like this person. And we'll see if we can get this working here. And there we go. Yeah, base model bias is definitely uh, definitely an issue there. Uh, so we've got this character. We've upped the weight of our Laura so that we're actually prompting for our character. This specific term, if you don't have the Laura, and I, I didn't, I didn't test this out before I used this prompt trigger. I probably should have, but this gives some like weird, like. Uh, like sci-fi futuristic armor kind of stuff. So it can kind of like push it in weird ways. Uh, we got like our character, he's got like mid mid length hair. Uh, he's got the, that kind of like open jacket look with, you know, tie on the inside. Uh, this one's just a leather jacket standing in front of wood. Right. So we've got the character, uh, there's a little bit of a style and this might just be the the watercolor and ink here we should change this to um painterly oil painting uh yes uh somebody called out that uh part part of this that's helpful is standing against a wall right a lot of the training data if we look back um i probably should have had more diversity here in this in this prompting um but we have in the data set this kind of like brick wall component so it's it's definitely does better with him in front of a brick wall let's try let's try putting him in front of an open background right um i think there might have been some examples in our data set where he's in like a, on like a beach um let's try something that's not in the training set let's see how this fails right let's push this around and see what makes this harder to prompt for um we'll say wearing a jacket in a forest scene, painterly oil painting. Uh, we'll generate two of those. Uh, someone called out one thing they're learning is that using the first version of your Laura model is going to be really helpful in figuring out what you need to do when you go back and train version two of your Laura model. That is very, very true. Um, 
So I think we already start to see a little bit of where this is kind of fallen in on our style, although this one's it's okay. Um, in the forest scene, this character tends to be generating without the beard, right? And a beard was in our training data set, but this is like a different domain. And this is kind of where like, again, someone called out, if it's in the training set, if we did a really good job of putting that together inside of the kind of core uh, training set, so in front of a beach, in front of a, a wall, uh, wearing kind of this like jackety type thing, it's gonna be it's gonna be able to do that a lot better. If you take it outside of that context, and again, this talks this goes back to the word that we use is generalize. If we take it outside of the context of the training data, it's going to struggle to understand that relationship as well. And that's why you want to compose as diverse a data set as you can. This is why more data is better. And when I say more data is better, I don't mean 200 images of the exact same thing. If I had 200 images of like this guy standing in front of a brick wall, it would be a really good Laura for generating a guy like this in front of a brick wall, but it wouldn't really generalize. It wouldn't be able to use that anywhere else. And so we're seeing some of the challenges here in the kind of the, the beard, at least concept generalizing. Now, this guy does kind of have some of the characteristics of our character. He's got mid length hair. He's got, um, you know, a uh, strong kind of nose. Uh, he, I would say he falls more into the like, you know, uh, manly man kind of look, right? Like a little bit broader shoulders and that kind of stuff. Um, so the question is like, well, what do we do here? We're not getting our we're not getting our concepts. Now we can supplement. So I can say short beard and see if that kind of helps bring back the beard concept. We're kind of like, you know, bringing that in. Um, it might kind of help. And I, in this case, I think it does, right? We're kind of like, we're, we're reminding it. It's like, okay, well, you still need that short beard concept. And the short beard does bring back, um, you know, some of the elements that we'd, uh, we'd seen in our training data set. It kind of helps it push it back more towards that character. Um, although I'd say this beard's a little bit like more bushy and longer than kind of maybe our core character. And this is, was, uh, uh, I guess, I mean, some some of these beards are a little bit longer. Those are all shorter. I mean, I think it's reasonable enough. I think the nose is really well captured. A lot of the facial features are captured there. He's got that kind of like wrinkle on his um, his forehead. Um, so that, that prompt did help bring that back. And I think this is another, going back to that concept of the map and the coordinates, we have trained the coordinates for a picture of Z43 care to go to this region where we get this guy who's got this kind of like, you know, sharp angled face and broader shoulders and kind of this like open jacket and, and a beard. And when we go outside of that place on the map, in the sense that like, it's not in a place that we normally have seen him before. He's not in the in front of an ocean or in front of a brick wall. He's like, now he's out in the forest. That's taking it off the area of the map that we've seen before. And maybe is pushing it into an area where in that region of the map, even though it has a lot of those characteristics we trained, in that region of the map, there's not as much beard there. And so by adding the beard back into the prompt, it's kind of taking us a little bit more into that, that region of latent space where there's the the beard concept. I know that this go, it all gets a little bit like woo woo. Uh, you know, I'm gonna tell you to bring out your crystals and pray for a good picture after this one. Uh, but you know, I think that the idea is, is uh, largely, if you think about this as nudging it in the right direction, I think you'll probably have a really good mental model for how to navigate this and how to think about, well, what are the things that we need to do to create a better data set? So now that I've got this data set working, right? I could I could use this to create more data in the forest. Um, what's another area that we're gonna find, um, you know, that isn't in the data set? Maybe in a, 
We'll see what happens when we do a spaceship sci-fi uh, attire. I don't even know what sci-fi attire is going to give us, but we'll give it a shot. Uh, what's going to be different about our character? Um, I predict our hair might change a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it did. Um, why? Because I think hairstyle kind of maps pretty heavily to like the genre you're in. You don't typically see as many like, you know, punk hairstyles and stuff. Uh, uh, the forest, for example, you don't see like mohawks in the forest. Similarly in space, we've got maybe a little bit more like a crew cut um, or, or at least like um, tight commander-ish looking hair. It's like combed and, and groomed. He's got a little bit more of like a, a prominent mustache. Uh, <laughs> And then uh, somebody, somebody in the audience does did comment, uh, zero gravity is not a friend of hair. And that's true. That's why you don't have really long hair. Every time I go to space, my hair gets all over the place. Um, so, you know, we've got a lot of the characteristics of our, our character here, but there's, there's definitely like this space element that has nudged us out of our like core concept of this guy into a general uh similar but generally different um character now in domain in space these characters share a lot of similarities right but between domains and by domain i'm talking about like you know um well in this context just where where that character is the place in the world between domains, we see a lot of, uh, and there's similarities, but there's definite differences. Like the type of beard here is a lot more like woodsman beard. And the type of beard here is more like commander. It's got some of that like white gray um, thing. And so that's that's a piece that's like very interesting um, to call out. And so if we think about what we're doing here, we've created our first data set. Our first Laura is useful for creating more data that aligns to this general concept. Now, the question you have to ask is, what are you actually trying to do with this? Is this a tool that is meant to replicate a very specific character? Because if that's the case, what you want to do is you want to generate as much consistency as possible as quickly as you can. And this might be good enough if you're going to be sketching out the character and it just needs to fill in, oh, the beard and the, the style and all that kind of stuff. If you're trying to kind of synthetically align it, um, what you're trying to do is filter only the examples that look really, really close and drive more diversity in your data set. So I probably want to find, you know, I would take this guy out. Uh, I would take this guy out. Um, I could probably ask myself whether these really fit the vibe I'm going for. I think they're a little bit more like villain, kind of villain-esque looking, um, guy rather than like very friendly. Maybe that's the character we've created. Uh, we'll take these out and yeah, I mean, I guess the question we have to ask ourselves is, do we think the faces look right? You know, and do we want to fix those? Do we want to try to iterate on that? Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I know we've got a lot of questions here. Uh, so I'm going to try to come back to some of these questions. Um, Suggestion that came from the audience, take notes when, with whatever changes you make between retraining. Um, if you want to be really methodical, change one parameter at a time to see how the output changes. Um, it, it takes more time to train to do it very methodically, but it helps you understand what's happening. If you change your captions, if you change your data set composition, doing it one by one means that you don't have to like ask yourself, how did we get this result? I changed four or five things and now it's completely different. You do it little by little, that can be very helpful. Um, someone asked the question, what does overfit mean? And the term overfit just means that um, it kind of has, it's learned a concept too well to the point where it's unable to generalize that to other things. And so in this case, it would be like if every time I asked for this character, 
it either gave me a guy in front of a brick wall or nothing like it, right? It was like, it's, it's like super overfit. It's, it's, it can only do that one thing and it kind of looks bad probably too. A lot of the times it's like, um, it, it looks kind of like overbaked and it kind of distorted and all that kind of stuff. Um, so we've got some other questions. Uh, when multiple characters and objects are trained, how do you combine them in a project to interact with each other? Um, so this would be, let's say you've got two characters and a set of props and you're trying to add them together. There's a lot of ways that that can go wrong. Um, there's also some like techniques that you can use to try to get that to work well. Um, if you have two Lauras, Laura A and Laura B, Laura A has a certain character and Laura B has a certain character. The, the challenge there is that they, those two might compete with one another when you're doing a generation. So you don't have a Laura of both these characters together in scenes. You have two Lauras that are trained on individual concepts of the character. And when you're prompting, it might be confusing to the model. It might be thinking you're trying to take character A and B and jam them together when you're prompting. It's not necessarily isolating them as much. Um, if you want the two characters to coexist, typically you want to kind of like train the model with those characters coexisting in some of those scenes. Now, what you could do, um, and this will be easier in future releases, uh, you can create you know, the two Lauras and then create new synthetic data that has those characters in it. So character A and character B are in that scene. And then you can train that into uh, the model as well. And that way you've got like more of this notion of there's this Laura is doing more than just one character. It's the entire Laura is handling both character A, character B, and both of them together. Now that can also be hard to tease out. I, I, I wish that this process was as simple as like push a button and you get a perfect model. It's, it's a lot of like really learning how to craft this tool for your process and your team. Um, but once you get the hang of it, you start to see, okay, I can like nudge it and get more and more useful tools. Um, yeah, somebody called out that I do have some sci-fi data in the training set like this and maybe this one. Um, I think there are some things that people have called out, like those, they're, they're pulled out. So like this spaceship background, you can see elements of that in the background, right? So I've actually nudged it to push that um, concept of if you're in a spaceship sci-fi sci vibe, you might be wearing orange and white armor of some sort. Uh, you might be in this kind of like, you know, domed background or, or circular background. Um, so this is kind of all again, goes back to like, when you train it, it's learning these relationships, even if you we're intending those to be there or not. So that's someone, someone a, has a good eye to catch the fact that those were in the training data set and actually came out. Um, someone commented that they are, uh, they would, they would buy that this is the same character and the face visuals are pretty consistent. I, I, I buy it too. I think it's really just like, what's the level of fidelity you're looking for? Um, I certainly think that if we were to do another set of training, and had this really consistent character and we're able to do that, then we would have an even better Laura, right? Is because we'd have more um, context there. Um, but I do think that there's some, yeah, I, I think there's some differences like this character and this character look a little bit different to me. There's something there, right? Uh, it's just not quite the same, but overall, I think you can iterate towards that um, and kind of get get that um, get them th get them there. Uh, catching up on the questions, um, <laughs> uh, someone said t telling telling everyone that we don't live in a perfect world is not the content they came here for. It's probably 
exactly true. I, I, I should either post clickbait or uh, positive vibes. Um, so let's talk now. Oh, we've talked a lot about like, you know, what to do with the Laura. Let's let's talk how I got to this consistent initial data set. Um, there are a couple of little tricks that I used to get a more kind of like specific and consistent character in like without the Laura. So I'm going to take my Z34 character off. I'm going to take um, this off. Uh, maybe we'll do Mohawk. Mohawk character now. Uh, and I'll show you the trick. I'll show you my trick. This is just one way to do it. All right, I'll show you a couple different ways. Let's do version one. And actually, let me let me see if I can remix this guy and get a picture of this that has um, extremely long hair and clean shaven. So I'm actually pushing it away from our character. But I'm going to see if I can get it to do something that gives me a cool new face that I can use. So we'll generate two of those. Um, Oh, he's in a spaceship with sci-fi attire. Okay, I forgot that part was in the prompt. I didn't pay attention, but it's kind of cool. You know, there's this guy looks pretty cool, right? He's like a very Fabio look. I like. Yeah, yeah somebody else called him Fabio. Uh, he's got he's got a vibe. He's got a real vibe. Um, hello, Fabio. Okay, I think I like this guy's face better. Uh, I'm gonna clean it up a little bit on the canvas real quick before we use it. Uh, we'll take this, do this, take it a little bit down, use an IP adapter to kind of keep it consistent, and then we will inpaint that face, give, give him a little bit more detail on that face so that we just have a really good reference face to use. Uh, get some more details in there. We like the details. Uh, <laughs> Someone said the man is setting impossibly high beauty standards for men in space. Uh, it's our chat, the, the ultimate challenge. Uh, I think. Go with the second one. Uh, yeah. I'm a little bit more like orange than I think I like. Uh, I don't want to fight. I don't want to. I don't want to mess around with this too much. Y'all are probably like waiting for me to get a move on here, so I'll just accept his like orangish face. What I what I would have done is gone in and done some coloring and like lightened up the skin tones. But we'll deal with this kind of like slightly sunburned uh, face. Yes, and said kind of oily. He's kind of got a kind of oily face. Uh, I would I would fix that up, but I, I just want to kind of show one way of doing this stuff. So we've got this guy's face. One thing that we can do is use the IP face adapter. Now, this is not face ID. This is just the face adapter. And what that means is it's not going to be perfect at regenerating this face. But if you think about this as like coordinates, again, going back to that map reference, coordinates that roughly get to the same place face-wise, if you leave it too high, what it ends up doing is it just kind of pastes the entire face onto the character in a weird way. So I typically kind of keep this pretty light. Um, I'll leave this at weight, maybe 0.35. I'll bring the instep percentage down. I want it to, to kind of like guide it into the basic structure of the face, but not just paste all the details in. So I kind of like really pull back towards the latter half of this. Um, and we'll try generating a, another character. Actually, oh, I'm trying to, not to do um, messing this up here. Uh, pull this guy here. It's back down to 0.35. Pull this down to 0.55. Okay. Take the Laura off. And I'm going to do a picture of a man. Bring one long hair, clean shaven. Right? 
But now we don't have any of the context from our Laura. This is a completely new generation. We're just using the face that I generated in an IP adapter. And we're gonna see what we get. So now we've got a really good looking Fabio guy. Uh, he doesn't have the same style. Uh, it's, a, it's separated from our Laura. So we've kind of really gone back to the base model. And because we're pulling off uh, on the inset percentage here, it's really just kind of like guiding some of the basics. Um, so, man, I wish I could get my hair to do that. Uh, this guy looks somewhat, somewhat aligned, right? Like it looks, it looks pretty good. Um, I am, I imagine if I changed this from extremely long hair, we might see some more like face differences. I think there's probably a relationship here between this, like, like long hair and this like facial structure. Um, I think we, we probably would see some bigger changes if we, um, move this to a different domain. And so I'm going to say, I'm going to change the hair mohawk and we're going to say short goatee in a forest plaid shirt. This is like we're 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 really jamming some people, uh, jamming some people here together. Now we're going to see what happens with this. This may be weird, right? We're kind of taking this face, we're pulling it out of the domain that we generated, and we're going to see what we can get out of it. I think the face is going to be a little bit different. Someone said cyberpunk lumberjack. Has <laughs> less of a mohawk and more of a business in the front part in the back. Uh, Dick, this is like the wild, the wildest hairstyle I've ever seen. Uh, it's really kind of trying to jam this, uh, it's trying to jam this long hair in the concept of a mohawk. Anyways, when we go into different domains, you now see that it has a big impact on the facial structure, right? This guy looks uh, like he's hanging out in the woods, but doesn't look like our super handsome Fabio with long hair in space. Like these are different characters, even though we're using the face uh, adapter. Someone said, increase the strength of the IP adapter. Let's see what happens here. Uh, I'll show you what happens. Kind of like, looks like it pastes his face, probably on this like weird, uh, weird look. Oh, it's actually not too bad. We'll see if that, see how that lands. Definitely impacts the hair. Uh, it's like ignoring my mohawk entirely, pretty much. It's also taken the short goatee off. It's like really forcing this this face. You like you can see where it's jamming in a lot of those details. Now, to be fair, consistent helps helps me get this um, across different domains. I've got more of this facial structure in by doing that, uh, but it also brought in a lot of that like rosy stuff that I didn't like, and. I'm not really getting different variations. Now, I don't know that I like that guy. This this gentleman uh, makes me uncomfortable to look at this man. Uh, <laughs> someone said he looks like he's from The Walking Dead. I think that's a pretty good fit. Uh, so this, this doesn't have as much variation as I would like. So this is where, where we can start asking ourselves, like, how do we inject enough prompt context that makes things kind of consistent across domains. Um, and, you know, IP adapter is one example of that. Um, I really wish we could get more of that Mohawk in, but we're losing a lot of face there. Um, another way to get this kind of like facial feature without a face, and then we can look at like combining these things together, um, is using a fake character name that's really, really long. So, and, and then you start to get into some interesting stuff, like what are names, what are names and what do they mean and how do they relate to one another? But if we do uh, Jonathan, James, uh, Jonathan, James, I don't want to use all J's, Abraham, uh, Goldman, uh, 
break let's see we'll see what that gets us right so i'm not using the face i've taken the face off i've got this um character name i it might even ignore this this super long name might ignore all of this stuff here um we'll see what we get but i'm going to generate and because i'm using the same name i should be able cross my fingers to see more consistency because i've kind of created this like place it's very very narrow coordinate of like facial features it's kind of like the average of all of these um these names We've got, uh, I mean, some facial consistency there. Uh, not a lot, but some. However, we got a lot more of this like lumberjack mohawk that I was going, right? Um, yeah, Jingle, Jingleheimer Schmidt. Um, if, <laughs> this is a big if, if I were drawn to this character, I could also then uh, take a, snap of his face and I'll take that out and I'll replace that with my IP adapter uh, and maybe I even want to zoom in more on the face again because like the thing that we're trying to capture here is not the hair or anything else it's just the face so we've got that face and we'll do one more with this mohawk just to see if we can get something that's a little bit more consistent and took took his hair down a little bit let's bring this down a little bit and see you can see what happens like his face is a little bit too too similar too controlled So we're going to use that. We'll generate another. We're getting some, some consistency here. we got some good like facial features that are staying consistent, right? This haircut's a little bit. It's changing a little bit, but we've got some good things. Now let's see what happens when we use the prompt that we had here. Picture of a man, extremely long hair, sci-fi attire, painterly oil painting in front of this that we were using and again this is all it's all imperfect but what you're trying to do is you're trying to find more tools that get you to the same character in different contexts so in this case i think we've got some facial features that are relatively similar it's not perfectly clean shaven not perfectly clean shaven but it does look like maybe this guy five, 10 years younger uh, in space. Someone said increase the strength of the adapter. If I increase the strength of the, ad the adapter, he's going to have facial hair. And this is the, the, the challenge that we're trying to combat here. So I think my prompt has clean shave in it. Uh, we can increase the strength. Um, oh, this guy's clean shaven. I, I mean, not too bad. Not too bad. Um, yeah, someone asked, uh, someone asked, I have not trained Alora on this character name of Jonathan James Abraham Goldman Brink Johnson. What I'm doing is kind of creating this like very strong set of coordinates that are the average of all of these names and because in a very specific order, because the model has learned if you give somebody a name, they should be kind of consistent. So if you have this like very, very long name, there's kind of this place that it gets to of that would be the assumption of what that person might look like. And you can just kind of hit that. Um, and it's a fake name. It's just a bunch of random words or random names jumbled together, but it's kind of like jamming those all in. And now we've got this kind of like tool that in combination with a very like low weight face adapter, we can kind of come in and start getting uh, some amount of consistency here with our like space, uh, space Fabio. Um, so we've taken the space Fabio that always looked like this. And now we've created this character that has a lot, I think a lot more realistic, uh, beauty and nuance, right? Doesn't look overly, we're not setting too high beauty standards. This is like, you know, I, I, I feel like this person might be real, right? And so now I've got this person in this sci-fi attire. 
what if I want, um, let's see, like a pompadour goatee in a uh, dive bar. And we'll do black leather jacket. Okay, so we still got this guy. We still got the name, but now we're trying to get him in a different like context. Doesn't have quite a pompadour. Let's see if we can get that pompadour up. It does have our face facial features? He looks kind of sad. Maybe that's what happens when you go to a dive bar. Um, someone asked, uh, "Where is it pulling the American flag on the uniform from?" S space people in space or astronauts often have like a patch with the um, American flag. So it's just again, it's like. It has all these relationships that have been baked in and kind of it, it, it interprets or understands. Um, and this is why training a model is really, really good because you can break those relationships. You can break those contexts um, and really push it in a direction that you can control. So we've got this guy. Well, Pompadour is like coming. It's not quite there yet. He also looks a little bit older. The nice thing is if you find a composition that you like, you can take this to the unified canvas and try to fix it, right? Or try to make it a little bit more um, perfect. Uh, so we've got this guy, let's say we want to, um, you know, come in and do some face fixing here. Uh, take this down. And, you know, we could take up our face. Um, here as well and try and move with a little bit higher of a uh I have a strength. All right, so now now we've got our guy in a dive bar. And maybe we like that, right? And so again, I've done all of this in the same style, but if I were really looking to, uh, if I were really looking to get a more flexible Laura, I'd want to try to create a lot of variation for this. Um, if I was only ever going to generate in this style and use this Laura for this style, it maybe doesn't matter. I can kind of keep it all in the same style. It's really, again, goes back to your objectives. What am I trying to do? A, what am I trying to train into this? What type of tool am I creating? Um, how is it going to be useful to me? B, two, I don't remember if I started with A or one, but B or two. Um, you want to ask yourself, like, what do you not care about? What type of variation do you not need? Because if you don't need variation across, you know, styles, if it's all going to be in the same style, you can kind of like um, generate only in that style and get variation that way. If he's only ever going to be wearing a black jacket, that's just his character. He always has a black jacket. Then you don't need different attire, for example. But what you really want to focus on is variation where you need it, right? Where do you need the variation? I need I need to get my black jacket pompadour guy in forests, in in spaceships, in bars, like wherever wherever I want that to be. I need to have. Uh, him in a black jacket, but I needs to be wherever it is, right? And that's how you kind of train it. Now, the other thing I'll call out is composition. In this, we only have this kind of like top half portrait. Um, I'm at this guy, I'm doing that guy. It's like an awkward, awkward photo. Um, if we were trying to use this to train a character that was a full bodied character, we'd have a hard time. And so this is where um, in my data set, when I did this originally, you'll see that I was also getting that same problem. I was getting kind of top halves uh, portraits. And then I went to this kind of like white background look. Now, this is where I've used a technique that I showed in the past. Um, we'll go to the uh, Unified Canvas. We'll just put a white background. We'll do kind of like a um, grayish blob in the center. And I'm just, I'm giving a very, very rough shape because I'm going to basically just do a full 
uh, image to image on this. Uh, and we'll say uh, standing on a white background, Pompadour goatee, blah, blah, blah. We'll pick out in a dive bar, black leather jacket. And turn this down a little bit and see if this gives us what we want. Nope. Uh, decrease our strength a little bit. Again, this kind of goes back to it's going to try to it's going to try to force this top half, and we're really trying to fight that. Um, this might be not enough to win demosing strength. No. Try portrait in the negative as well, and maybe we'll try. Um, Character on set part. Full body. Uh, someone said full frame photo is an alternative, but I think this one might be working as well. We got we got something. I don't know if this is what we were going for, but we got something. Uh, yeah, I mean, a little bit, a little bit. We probably want to go in and fiddle with that. Full frame photo did not work for us. Uh, the body shot did. Try another full body shot. He's <laughs> legs looking kind of a little weird. Got some uh, some janky legs. This looks a little bit better. At least the proportions look a little bit better from the preview, right? We got that, and then we'll go in and we'll iron out the face. Take out full body shots and do just this. And we can leave the denoising strength pretty high because there's this white background that helps contain the structure a little bit. Um, and because we're coming in closer, we're going to kind of help generate that face with a little bit more consistency, right? So now we've got our character, full body. I, I probably would want to do something like a control net here to get better proportions. So this looks a little weird to me. Um, <laughs> uh, so people are commenting on his, his physique, uh, and I... I agree, he's got a little bit of weirdness down here in the lower half. His feet look a little bit skipped leg day. Um, <laughs> so, someone says they're disappointed in, in the lack of faith in my gray drawing skills. They didn't like my blob. Um, but you get the idea. I mean, now we've got this character in a kind of full body pose. Uh, we can save that out. And obviously, like, We'd want more context. We'd want to switch out and kind of get this, this character. But then we would come back and we would caption this to make sure that we've got, we'll just call this guy like um, uh, JJ Abraham Goldman. Uh, we'll, we'll caption that with consistently in the data set. That's his name. And in this one, we would probably say something to the effect of like full body shot, uh, wearing a, a black trench coat, um, you know, describing him black pants, brown shoes, uh, what style we would kind of use to describe this. This one is more of like a character portrait. Maybe I'd even describe this as like, um, it's a little bit more oil painting. It's like photorealistic oil painting type thing. Um, this we might include this right and we might say young jj abraham goldman uh in space you know in on a spaceship wearing sci-fi attire whatever it is uh i'd probably call out american flag patch just so that it's like helping break that relationship between when i'm in space i have a a, a patch if you prompt for the if you prompt for all of the different things what you're doing is you're making it very clear that those are separate concepts and they're not linked together. If I just prompted this guy a sci-fi attire, it might 
strengthen the relationship between the patch and the sci-fi attire because it's like okay it's in sci-fi attire and there's a patch there he didn't prompt for a patch so that must mean the sci-fi attire is the the thing that has a patch right like it's it's building those relationships even if you don't think about it you're kind of implying that those relationships exist um so i know that we're like at time uh and so i'll be respectful of everyone and kind of drop off but hopefully this was kind of an interesting ex exploration into like this notion of consistency and generating synthetic data sets for the purposes of training you would use this if you were just starting off with a character and you wanted to drive um drive towards building a tool that you could use in future creations if you wanted to use a tool for prompting for this type of character um you might use it early on in the concept pipeline, build some stuff with it, and then use that later on uh, concepting to train the model even better on that character. Again, this goes back to your first version of the Laura is not your final version. It's just the first iteration, and you're going to iterate on that and train it and build on that data set over time. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, if you all have more questions, someone mentioned we do have a models and training channel in the Discord. You can go to the models and training section and talk about this stuff. We have open source scripts for running training and uh, sneak uh, peek, but coming up in the future on the hosted product, we'll have a very robust training uh, solution for professional studios who are trying to do this at scale, trying to manage lots of data and trying to manage this, this type of training across teams and improve the quality of their results. Uh, so feel free to uh, reach out if you got questions, but take a look at the Discord. If you're watching this after the fact, uh, we'll include some stuff in the YouTube uh, details for the repos as well as the Discord so you can join in and ask questions. Uh, but it was a lot of fun. We'll see you guys around. See ya.